Hi guys, welcome to a slightly overdue episode of Quick Quarter Killer Birds. In this one, we're going to be painting a gentle little bird with lots of movement. Let's take a look. So little is a bit of an understatement here. Not only is this a member of the hummingbird family, already a group of mostly tiny birds, this is the smallest of the bunch, which is the bee hummingbird. And we'll actually be painting a female in this video with brilliant bright blues, but also a few soft purples to balance them out. So for me, it can be hard to capture that kind of almost iridescent plumage that some of these sorts of birds have. And I find the trick is to keep the wash very light, but with just enough pigment to make those colors pop. And then I really aim for those kind of broken brush strokes that let plenty of the white of the page show through. So in order to capture the tiny and delicate nature of a bird like this, I'm going to attempt to also keep the colors very soft, but we are going to inject some contrast and some movement with a nice dynamic splashy background. And I'm also going to attempt to do the bird in just one nice fresh wash. And then we're gonna kind of drop other colors into that at different stages as it dries. So first up, let's look at the drawing and the materials, and then we're gonna dive into the painting. So don't forget, you can hop over to the public section on my Patreon page to find the line drawing and also the reference photo. All the links are in the description. In this one, you can just use an HB or a 2B pencil. We're gonna go quite lightly to start and overall we don't wanna to go too dark anyway. And I've just got a bog standard rubber if I need to take anything out or to lighten any part of the drawing. As always here, the key is to lay down the big shapes first. We're always working from big general shapes down to small and specific ones with the details just being little decorations on top. And the main aim here is to get the big shapes, not only the right proportion in relation to each other, but also very importantly, we really need to look at the tilt or the angle of these specific shapes. It's getting these right, or in some cases actually exaggerating them, that can give us the character and the movement of a subject like this. And then once we have the proportion and the tilt, we can then slowly refine the shapes and always sticking to that mantra of simple but accurate. And then finally, we can add just a few details to help inform the painting later on. And I also find this is a great time to really explore and get to know our subject ready for the painting. I find I'm already kind of thinking about how I might tackle an area whilst I'm drawing it out. So I'm working on A3 Windsor & Newton professional paper. It's cold press, so it's got lots of lovely texture, which I really enjoy. And I'll also be using a size 16 faux squirrel round. It's kind of soft and lively. And then I've got a, a nice synthetic size 10, a round one, and that's for the smaller areas and any dry brush work. Very finely, we've got the colors. And first up, we have, of course, the color that makes it onto almost every painting or almost every palette of mine is ultramarine blue. It's soft and purpley. Uh, and I just love it. And then we've got thalo blue, which is a very powerful, but beautifully rich, deep blue with a bias towards greeny kind of turquoise colors. It keeps its very strong, intense color even when we add lots of water. And it also provides a really nice, deep, rich dark when we want it. Then the red I'm using is carmine. It's a lovely cool red. You could easily replace it with anything like a lizard and crimson or a darker magenta, any kind of cool red. And then the yellow is a lemon yellow. It's a nice cool yellow that will help push the thalo blue towards that kind of more greeny turquoise hue if I want it. And then if I really need a little extra help with those turquoises, I do have this color, which is turquoise blue, and it is the only opaque color in this particular bunch. So a quick note, if you would like to see more real-time paintings, along with in-depth tutorials, quick tips, live streams, and loads of ever exclusive content, you can come and join me on my community over on Patreon. And in fact, two of the most recent full-length, fully narrated real-time paintings that are over there are another hummingbird and also uh, a beautiful eagle owl. I love painting those. You can also watch time-lapse versions with commentary at some of the lower tiers. Don't forget with Patreon, you can subscribe monthly and you can cancel at any time, but you can also now sign up for my page with an annual subscription. And this is currently going with 16% off the 12 month cost. Uh, all the links are in the description. Please come and say hello. Also, are there any particular birds that you would like to see me paint? Please do pop your answers into the comments. Also, are there any particular birds you would like to see me paint? Pop your answers into the comments. That's it, let's get painting. 
So we're going to kick off with a nice watery wash, just clear water, quite a lot of ultramarine and little touches of carmine which push it towards like a really soft purple. Putting loads of water in there because I want it to be a nice kind of mid-tone shadow. And the trick here is that the, the paint looks still quite dark but because it's got so much water in it, as it dries it will dry a fair bit lighter so it looks darker than you you might want it and ordinarily I might not start with such an exacting area I'm really holding the brush quite low down here close to the um, uh, close to the bristles and having to be quite accurate and that's because I just wanted to get the head shape kind of correct and I'm just looking for a continuous simple shadow all the same tone all the same color right from the tip of the beak on the underside of the head in shadow even into the eye which will go darker eventually but then we, we kind of bring that down and we're looking for like a nice little interesting shape of shadow I'm working on about a 30 degree tilt here so all of the paint kind of beads um, lower down in the wash so that little that little dark bead that I'm working into now that's kind of the driving force behind the watercolor that's the bit we keep picking up and working with and then the rest remains damp and slowly dries and we can put different color into that and look how I'm linking the shadows together that's such an important part of watercolor exactly the same color exactly the same tone exactly the same paint consistency to start with so it's all one nice fresh wash and then the trick is that I can now drop in kind of slightly more saturated pigment as I go uh, that's a little bit too strong a blue although it will dry significantly uh, softer in color and that's one of the things I love about ultramarine ultramarine granulates and it looks quite blue and intense when you start almost too blue but I know that if I gray it down it'll look too gray for what I'm after so I mix in a little bit more red and the, the trick here is with watercolor you can keep working a wash as long as it's fairly wet as soon as that wash dries past a certain point and the, the pigment starts to settle that's when you start to muddy the watercolor but as long as you keep this wash alive you almost can't go too wrong if you if you go too dark you can pull the pigment out you can wash the pigment out with clear water if you've gone too light you can just keep loading more pigment in there uh, the only the big problems may arise if the water in your brush or there's more water in your brush than the pigment you're working into that's when we can kind of get cauliflowers so for the first time I'm introducing the the um, the turquoise color and I want to keep it really light so again it's quite watery it's got enough pigment in there to look turquoise and nice saturated color but I'm just trying to find that balance between that and keeping it nice and light letting it run into the shadow color in places and very purposely using the brush quite lightly to kind of scrape it over the surface to create that slightly broken brush stroke that's going to give lots of whites to the page and it's going to give as best as I can get that kind of iridescent feeling where you've got lots of light reflecting off the lovely light turquoise color and then the joy is here we've now got a small wash of turquoise which we can drop more pigment into if we want not forgetting that our colors will dry lighter and also they look darker than they will eventually look because there's no deep dark on the page they're the darkest color there the more darks we introduce relatively the colors that we have on there will look lighter so this whole wash right from the beak down into the turquoise head down into the purple of the underside of the head and the body up into the underside of the wing that is all still wet or at least kind of damp so I can now drop paint into it this kind of wet into wet approach where we're loading an existing wash I use a lot more carmine red and uh, a heavier content of pigment less water just to make it darker and to drop that into the existing drying wash and I will continue to do that that's what I was talking about earlier on I'm going to continue to work this as one continuous wash or at least it will have the illusion of being that and in most places it will be tiny 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 touch of phthalo blue just to go a bit darker remembering that that's a really powerful color and I don't want to go over the top with it I'm just kind of slowly but surely picking my hits leaving lots of whites of the page for now keeping the pigment lighter than I think it needs to be because we can always go darker and we can always cover more whites of the page as time goes on so we kind of err on the side of less is more and light with a view that we can go darker 
So I felt like I'd covered too much of the paper there, so I just put in a damp brush, pull the pigment back out again. You can see I'm constantly wiping my brush on the, uh, the kitchen towel that I have at the top because I always want to control the amount of water that's in there and the amount of pigment. And now we're just slowly working into the back of the body. I know that I want the right hand side of the body where the turquoise is to be hit by light. I don't want it to be as bright as the white that I'm leaving in the centre of the body but I still want that kind of broken brush feel and I want it to be a very light tone so that we get a, a gentle feeling of form and the form comes from moving around the form with a variation of tone. It doesn't always have to be from a deep dark to a bright light but from a darker tone to a lighter tone will create form. And for the first time we're dropping in a pretty dark shadow here. Again, it will dry lighter, but this is the uh, the ultramarine blue, but with a lot less water in and a little bit of carmine. So it takes it to a very, very dark blue with a tinge of purple to it. And we're just laying that much more saturated pigment, maybe like double cream consistency into the damp wash. And then we just attempt to leave it alone and just let the paint do its thing. You can see I'm kind of hovering over the wash on the body. Most of it is dry, so I don't want to go back into it. It's at the stage where I'd muddy it, but this lower half that I did later and is also lower down the page, so the water's collected there and it's more damp, that I can work into still. It's still at a paint consistency that I can work into it. And now for the first time we're going to think about the background. I'm just going to kick off, the backgrounds can be tricky, we're going to look at that in the quick tip section, but I start off with the, the turquoise, the turquoise blue, and I don't mind hitting the, the most four wing initially and catching the edge and getting a soft edge there. A bit of splattering always looks fun, gives some movement. I never know quite exactly what I'm going to do with the background, I kind of make it up as I go. I'm going to talk about leaving negative shapes around the birds in a minute. And we start nice and wet and watery because again we can always go darker. Nice direct hard kind of definite brush strokes and then we can always soften them down with clear water like I'm doing here. So again as long as you're quick you've got time here you can put in clear water and it won't cauliflower as long as you're careful you keep working the paint like moving it around. There's a great saying that once the wash dries it dies like as long as you keep that wash alive and wet you can do different things with it. Notice how I am leaving a little bit of white on the leading edge of the currently painted wing just to separate it from the background a bit. And at this stage I've actually left the, the background wing clear and the idea is that I want to work that wing as the background wash is drying. I didn't set off expecting to do that, it's just kind of happened naturally as the painting has evolved, so I've got to kind of work with that idea. And I'm trying to create a background here that creates a nice overall design. Not being afraid in watercolour especially, but in any painting, to leave lots of areas of a painting with not much going on, and in this case the white of the page. It doesn't always have to be the white of the page, but at least a big area with nothing going on. And the design is kind of shoved a little bit up into the right hand corner to make it interesting. Not bang in the middle of the page, although the bird is fairly central. Along with the background it makes the design kind of top right corner. And then the wash on the back is still wet but it is drying, it's kind of got a dampness to it. And if I'm going to drop any other colours into it, now's the time, because if it goes any longer it will be too late. That colour's a little bit too heavy and dark, so I, I clean off my brush. Um, and I go back in with a purple to push that darker and then I will be softening this blue ever so slightly as time goes on. But again knowing that the colour will dry slightly lighter than I'm putting it on. So even at this stage this wash is almost dry, the tail down here. This is when we start to move to a little bit of dry brushwork or certainly a more kind of double cream, almost buttery consistency not quite at the pure dry brush of kind of that marmite consistency but not far off. So the pigment is darker and it also allows for sharper marks. So I'm starting to just place in 
that wash is still damp there so I can work into it just starting to place in some slightly darker colours but I'm very wary of going too dark I'm thinking very carefully about where are the darkest tones on here if I ignore the eye how dark do I want to go in the rest of the body the most painted wing at the moment is in shadow so there I do want to go dark but even that is not currently as dark as I could go so I could go darker there so we're going to the the smaller synthetic brush now because I just want to do a little bit of work in here uh, some more interesting shapes like looking for some more interesting shapes in there um, yeah still decided that that blue was too dark so I've pulled out the pigment which I can do while it's wet and also not forgetting that it will appear lighter as it dries and I put in the deep darks elsewhere this wash is still wet up here so just dropping in like two or three little spots of the more saturated darker paint just to give it a slight feeling of um, the plumage just because it's not a flat plumage it's got like variation of tone within the feathers and just to make it more interesting we don't want to do that everywhere we want to find a balance between nice flat simple washes in places versus other washes that have a bit more texture and a bit more about them if we had texture everywhere it would look over the top uh, and kind of conflict it would be all shouting for our attention but if we had similarly just flat washes we might lose some of the form or we might lose an opportunity to have a bit of interest coming from a bit of variation of the plumage so here i'm kind of tentatively tackling the wing uh, i needed to cut the background in a little bit more into the background wing so that we didn't end up with a conjunction which would have been where the line of the back wing flowed perfectly into the line of the front wing and that would have looked odd uh, and it would have jarred the eye a little bit so this is a kind of purpley mix, a lot more biased towards the carmine because this wing is getting hit by the light a little bit more. Kind of a damp wash. Um, I'm not minding if I hit the drying background wash. I kind of want those to flow together a little bit wet into wet or at least damp into damp. Just so that background wing is very much there but it's softer and less defined than the foreground wing. And I want to give a gradation from like a dark tip through to maybe saying that the light is hitting the background area a little bit more or the you know the, the where the wing is behind the other wing if that makes sense so i'm just going to push this edge darker very carefully in order to throw out the foreground wing so we're, we're always looking for this counter change the front leading edge of the most foreground wing is very dark against the lighter tone as the wing comes back towards us it gets lighter so what's behind it I darken kind of accentuate that light edge on the back of the wing and then um, as we move up the wing to the tip the wing closest to us that wing gets darker so in order to throw out the dark edge the back edge of the wing I make the wing behind it slightly lighter so we get what's called counter change an edge goes from being light against dark to dark against light and just as this dries now I'm going in with almost pure pigment it's got a little bit of kind of residual dampness in the brush which helps the paint kind of flow a little bit more but this is kind of more defined definite brushwork a little bit of um, pigment into that area just to create some interest and what this is great for is providing that kind of sharp definition what you'll find is we can work very wet into wet for quite a long time and it can feel like it's not really going anywhere or it's looking a bit unfinished that was a little dark for just to suggest a foot but no more than that but as soon as we put in that lovely dark with a dry brush and a more defined mark suddenly all of these lovely areas of softness and wet into wet start to make sense and we start to get that contrast of sharper edges with the softer edges and it begins very quickly to feel more finished it's almost like in acrylics and oils when we start to put on the thicker paint and the lighter paint and the definition the painting begins to feel more finished or we can kind of see where it's going it's exactly the same with watercolor when we start putting on those sharper marks 
some of the dark, some of the more defined marks, we can kind of get a sense of where the painting's going for the first time. And I certainly start to feel a little bit more confident at this point and start to get a glimpse as to whether it's going to work or not, <laughs> or if I should pursue it because it might work. So just having a little think about where on earth to go next, basically. And we're going to start getting into that background. I was trying to decide whether I make the head darker and put the details in, or if I actually go for a background behind the head of the bird. And I decided to get more movement, make it a little bit more dynamic. We go for a background behind the bird. Not entirely sure what I plan to do with it at this stage, I'm just kind of going for it. As long as we keep it light, the paint that I'm working on top of is dry so we don't cause any problems, we should be fine. I kind of intended these wings to be a bit more wet into wet, but I've kind of had to commit to bringing that paint down. So I'll lose a little bit of the soft wet into wet work, but I don't think it's going to matter too much. What I've effectively done is created a really lovely, deep, rich wash to now work into more and more. And at this stage, I'm kind of thinking about having one of those big sweeping brush strokes kind of coming in behind the bird to give it that movement to make it an interesting design. When it comes to these backgrounds, I tend to just get some paint down and then work into it. I don't always have a clear idea in mind. I like splash paint into it. I wash it about. Uh, I let it drip down the page. I let it kind of give me something. Then I've got something to go on effectively just make a bit of a mess being aware of the limitations and what your sub your medium can do and then letting that dictate where the rest of it goes so it feels like it wants to go higher uh, it definitely wants to go darker which i'll get to in a minute then the trick is to find a way that it it work, moves into the existing background and as long as i use just pure clear water over the um the dry wash at the bottom I'll be fine. So I'm holding it a little bit flatter here because I don't want the paint to come down the page so much. I want it to kind of sit where it is. Like these interesting brush strokes that I'm kind of doing where I'm just wiggling the brush about. I'm really just laying in pigment. It looks like a really odd brush stroke and you want to tidy it up to start with, but we know that watercolour kind of levels itself out, out when it's wet. It kind of smooths itself out. So it's really just a way of injecting more pigment and a bit of movement and energy into the paint and we don't need to neatly cover up all of the paint we let the paint do the work we kind of pop it in there let it do its thing so i'm finding it's um you know i'm, I'm struggling a little bit because i'm getting very hard edges between everything and at this stage I'm not entirely sure whether the background is actually going to work or not have I made a mistake tackling it like I have I'm kind of committed now so I've just got to follow through and make it work here I want it to softly blend into the existing turquoise so I just keep hitting the edge where the blue the dark blue meets the turquoise with clean water and a damp brush and then I decided that was too hard an edge where I had it. So again, a clean, slightly damp brush. I'm pulling out pigment uh, and hitting the edge of that paint with a soft brush. And that softens the edge. It makes it um, feel more gentle and not so sharp. And in reality, we want a combination of hard edges and soft edges. We don't always know exactly where we want them and when we want them or even why we want them. We just kind of have to go with it and make it look good. And you've really got to trust your instinct here, which... Um, your instinct gets better the more you paint but just kind of trust yourself like if you think ah, that edge just looks too hard then go in and soften it and you've got to soften it while it's wet or while it's damp because as soon as it said or as I said sorry as soon as it dries it's kind of dies and you can't do anything more with it other than go over the top and make it even darker and that might not be what you're after so I continue to soften this edge here. What we've got is the dark background trapping a lovely sharp edge and a lovely bright light on the head, which has really worked. What I didn't like was the way that I had that little triangle between the wing, the head and the background was too sharp edged everywhere. So that's why I kept softening that area. I like the shape itself, that little white segment between the head, the wing and the background. 
that's an important negative shape which is what we're going to talk about in the quick tip section in a second and also I'm working flat here I'm holding um, or I was holding it up we'll get a little bit of glare in the top right hand corner from the lighting um, but as it dries for the rest of the painting that won't be a problem and at this stage I'm starting to feel better about the background. I'm pulling out a little bit of pigment where I took the background too close to the leading edge of the wing. Um, but now I've got to this stage you can see I'm kind of sitting back and not doing much because I'm kind of calm again. So this is a great point to take a little break and look at the quick tip section where we're going to look at that interaction between the background and the object. So what I wanted to talk about here is creating a background that interacts well with the bird or whatever it is that you're painting. So nothingly over complicated and in this case it's more of an abstract background that simply kind of supports the overall painting and adding movement and contrast at the same time. So we'll kind of get to more literal backgrounds in some future videos. And there's no right or wrong here. Um, but there are certainly some things that I would like to talk about that will hopefully help you make decisions when it comes to creating your own backgrounds. So firstly, there's nothing wrong with having lots of space around our subject. So in watercolour, lots of white at a page, and in this one I pushed not only the bird, but also the background over to the one side, and I left lots of space on the left side. Now for me, this gives a nice feeling of movement kind of into the page and it helps with the direction of movement of the bird uh, in this case and that was kind of the main objective and often with something like this simple is best we don't need to overthink it and if we're feeling brave we can even kind of leave it open to a bit of evolution as we go then the important thing to think about is how that background is interacting with the bird itself again it doesn't have to be complicated or clever but just a little thought can go a long way and whilst there's lots of factors to think about and different things that we can do, when we're talking about this particular principle, my main objective is usually based around the tonal values, uh, that being how light or dark an area is. So firstly, I wanted the head and the beak to really be the focal point. So this is a nice sharp, darker shape against a pure white background. So this is an area of sharp focus and lots of tonal contrast with a nice, clear, easy to understand part of the painting. Now the top area of the background is nice and dark and it traps some areas of light on the back but at the same time there's a bit more crossover between the background and the bird so that it's purposely not as clean a shape as the head and then the tail is also kind of drifting in and out of sharpness and ties in with the background in areas so we're kind of playing with what's called lost and found edges here to create some nice contrast um, and some interest against a very sharp head. Then the coloured wash from the underside of the bird appears to flow directly into the background shape. Uh, and this is allowing the two areas of similar tone and colour to merge together. And this is a really beautiful aspect of watercolour that I love. Although I will say that this tiny slither of the white of the page was very deliberate to give just enough of an edge to hint to the viewer that there is at least a little bit of separation there. And then this wash continues under the wing, giving us a nice sharp and again a very clear edge to contrast with the completely lost edge from a little bit further back. So all of this might sound over complicated or overly complicated, but the main takeaway point here is to think about your edges. And we can have hard, sharp edges, we can have softer, more gentle edges, and we can have completely lost edges and little subtle variations in between. And then to break down these into kind of simple, understandable terms that we can think about, we can have a dark object or an area of an object against a light background. We can have a light area of an object against a darker background. We can also have a darker area of an object against a similarly darker area, and that creates a kind of lost edge. And then finally, one that I don't have much of here, but we can also have a light area against another light area. Um, and there's one or two tiny examples here. And then let's very quickly go back to the one we're working on and kind of apply those same principles. So the bird itself is pushed up and the whole design, which includes the background, is also kind of pushed up towards the top right hand corner, giving us lots of space below and to the left, which to my eye gives a nice feeling of upwards movement and a pleasing kind of overall design. 
And again, the main consideration here was the interaction from a tonal point of view. So again, I wanted to draw attention to the head. This time, however, I chose very light, soft colors and tones for the head, and I contrasted them with the very strong dark background. And although notice that the dark beak against the bright white of the background is also a very readable, clean design, very easy to understand. And I also left the page completely white here to accentuate the lovely soft shadow shape on the underside of the bird. And then finally, two seemingly small but actually very important areas are these two here. Now this is a great example of what we call negative shapes. And these are the shapes around or between our objects, the object being the positive shape, or between two or more definite positive shapes. So in this case, the positive shape of the bird and the positive shape of the abstract dark that is the background, the negative shape being the space in between these. So whilst we could have happily painted the dark right up to the bird here, for me, this little negative shape makes the whole overall design just a bit more clear and a bit more readable to the viewer. And it nicely separates the darker tones of the background, the darker tone of the wing and the slightly darker area on the back of the head. And then this little area here, we have exactly the same principle. So that's it for the quick tips. Lots more on backgrounds and negative shapes to come. Don't overthink it, but do try to have a little bit of a plan in mind that can evolve, but one that consciously considers these kind of basic questions of how am I seeing an area from a tonal point of view. Okay, so on that note, we're going to dive straight back into trying to finish off the background now. So this is quite an exacting bit again, so you're going to have to kind of bear with me because I'm going to have to paint very close to the underside of the head and quite accurately because I don't want to alter the shape too much. Obviously the, the shadow that I painted earlier on the, the underside of the body and the head is nice and dry so it's great to work into and I kind of know what I want to do. I want to keep that dark coming in behind the back of the head and it's going to really throw out and accentuate the lovely soft tone and the lovely soft colour of the underside of the beak and that lovely kind of ultramarine with a little bit of purple um, on the underside of the head or the head in shadow. So yeah, what we do here is we can give the illusion of a very quick, broad brush stroke, but actually um, with a small brush, the size 10, I'm being quite exacting and really painting up closely to the underside edge of the head. Then once I've got that wash correct and I like it, then I can load it with more pigment and try and kind of at least keep it slightly in keeping with the um the lovely dark background that we've got there uh, on the other side of the beak so that's kind of it we, we, we've got i've got the sweep of the background that i like it needs a little bit more work to to kind of work well but um yeah that pigment uh, it had too much cobalt uh, sorry too much turquoise in it and the turquoise is quite a heavy pigment because it's opaque and it would made the paint go a little bit too opaque when I wanted it to look more kind of um, translucent like the right hand side so I pulled out some of the pigment and get more thalo out and the thalo is beautifully transparent but it's also really rich and dark and that's why the thalo works especially well loading it into that wash and then if I really really want to push that wash darker which I have done already and you will see me continue to do because the thalo is so greeny it's almost towards the, um, the kind of turquoise part of the colour wheel. It's almost opposing to the purpley red. And so when I mix the dark purpley red with the blue that's very greeny, they kind of cancel each other out and they give us a really rich dark. Then the only other th factor to actually make it dark is the water content, obviously more water making it lighter. So lots of carmine, lots of thalo. They kind of cancel each other out. Um, uh, and then it's just using a heavy pigment content to keep loading those washes and pushing them darker and darker and just pulling out little bits uh, where I've splashed the, the painting there. So I've just let the painting dry off a little bit and you can see I just added a little bit more to the wash in the top right hand corner and then that background is done. You can see how beautifully it's dried. Um, you can see where I've splattered a little bit of paint on the background as it's drying. It's actually given a lovely kind of mottled splatted effect. So we can kind of see now properly where this is going. 
As I said, the painting is completely dry at this stage. And we're coming in and we're looking for the finishing details. And really the only details to be done are just bringing that eye to life. I love that the majority of the bird was done in that single wash. Lots of wet into wet, dropping in more pigment as we go. And the only job now is just to get that eye done. We dive into the eye with a fairly dark tone using the ultramarine and the carmine that pushes it nice and dark. Then we have like a small wash in the eye and we can then continue to load that. I really wanted to look at how the dark on the beak um, gently kind of moves into the dark of the eye. Uh, that's quite an important little thing and it kind of again it's linking shape so nothing is too isolated it can be isolated especially with birds if their plumage is literally isolated markings but here we've got a lovely dark on the beak uh, and the, the top part of the forehead and I want to link that into the dark of the uh, of the eye just to create a bit of unity and then we have these lovely markings on the eye and because I've gone so wet into wet and so little detail in the rest of the bird um, I know that I can get away with like a more detail more definition smaller marks in the head area so I'm using my synthetic size 10 here because it's got a bit more control I'm using the very tip of it and just gently kind of working the paint around I'm working with a Still a wet into wet wash, but it's a very, very, very small wash on an existing dry one. And the trick is just not to go too far with it. Don't go too dark too quickly. Don't look for all the details. Look for a simplified version of your subject. I'm slightly darkening the the the, uh, the shadow edge of the um, of the beak now, just to kind of give that a bit more oomph, especially in contrast to the lovely deep dark background. And really we're kind of massively on the home straight here. And there's not really a lot more to do. I'm just I just continue to load this little wash on the forehead. I'm thinking how dark can I get away with it going? How defined can I get away with going? And, you know, just to give it a bit more form, give it a bit more umph, give it a little bit more interest and a little bit more detail in what is probably probably the focal point, or it's the bit that we look to first as the eye and the head. Uh, and then the painting kind of leads us around um, and because of the nature of the background it's for me it's got a very pleasing design to it all that white of the page in the bottom left corner really works and the design itself is up into the right hand corner um, and it gives kind of a movement that counteracts the movement of the bird they're kind of opposing but complementary if that makes sense and basically that's it as always, the ideal is to look for simple shapes, work out what tonal value we're aiming for, and then just lay down the paint and leave it alone to do its thing. We know that watercolour is at its best when we are not constantly telling it what to do. I'm as guilty as anyone of going in and fussing about too much, but please take it from me, just leave it alone, let it do its thing. So I really loved the end result. For me, it had everything that I kind of wanted, everything I was after, everything I wanted to capture. If you enjoyed the video, please do feel free to share. It really helps me out. And to stay up to date with all of the new content that I've got planned, please do consider subscribing. And don't forget, if you've got a bird that you'd like to see me paint or any watercolour topics you'd like me to cover or questions to answer, please pop them into the comments below. And until next time, guys, happy living, happy creating, and I will catch you soon.